Good morning, and welcome this morning to Bower Hill Church. Grace to you and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Please join in the call to worship. In the beginning, darkness covered the deep, and God said, let there be light. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Through the words of the prophet, the Lord said, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Do not fear, says the Lord, I am with you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. When Jesus was baptized by John, suddenly the heavens were opened. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. And as Jesus was coming up out of the water, the Spirit of God rested upon him like a dove. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. And a voice said, You are my beloved child. With you I am well pleased. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Mighty God, you anointed Jesus at his baptism with the Holy Spirit and revealed him as your beloved child. Keep us, your children, born of water and the Spirit, faithful in your service that we may rejoice to be called children of God. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Merciful God, in baptism you promise forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves separated from one another. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us captive. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Fulfill the promises of our baptism so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so God speaks to us. 
You are my child, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Amen. Welcome again to the service of worship. This is a day that we call Baptism of the Lord. It's when we talk about the day that Jesus decided to be baptized. And this is kind of kind of the end of the Christmas season. It's all over now. It's all behind us. And we follow Jesus into his adult ministry. If you are following our services but not receiving our bulletins, you might sometimes be a little bit lost as to what's going on. There are responses, there are readings, there are things, lyrics to hymns that you may not have with you. And if that is the case, you can email the church's office and let us know that you would like to receive the weekly bulletin that goes out every Saturday with a link to the service. Also, if you would like to follow find the bulletin right now, you could pause the video and go to bowerhillchurch.org forward slash live. And you could print the bulletin and use it now, or you could follow it on another device. bowerhillchurch.org forward slash live. Let us pray. Saving God, source of our calling, your word is full of power and glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may receive your grace and live as your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Since our theme is water today, our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is taken from Genesis 1 and verses 1 through 5. Listen to God's word to you in this creation narrative, this first creation narrative in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. 
Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our reading from the book of Psalms from the Psalter today is taken from Psalm 29. Please respond with the bolded parts. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of God's name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord, over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare, and in God's temple all say, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to God's people. May the Lord bless God's people with peace. And finally, our gospel reading today is taken once again from the gospel according to St. Mark. This is a passage that we read part of just recently in the season of Advent. Listen to it again with fresh ears. This is Mark chapter 1 and verses 4 through 11. And this is from the old revised standard version. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and he had a leather girdle around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandal I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as he was coming up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word. And to God's name be glory and praise. Amen. Was the water cold in the River Jordan? Was it muddy? Was it opaque? Was it impossible to see how deep the currents ran? Was the water cold to your skin as you stepped down away from the sandy banks? Did you get goosebumps from the cold or from the uncertainty or maybe even from the fear? not knowing where those currents would carry you? Did you have any sense at all of where that muddy flow might take you? Did you know that those waters would bear you away forever from the quiet life that you once knew? Simple days in Galilee, sunlight over flowering meadows, your long-ago life, the rhythmic snoring of the saw and the Steady knocking of the hammer? Did you know where those baptismal waters would take you? From this place here in the wilderness, up to your waist in water, could you see? All the way to 
the upper room to Gethsemane, to the judgment hall, to the cross? And would you have turned around and gone straight back up the hill and gone home if you could have seen? What would, our world, what would our world be if Jesus of Nazareth, the simple carpenter, had dipped his toe in the chilly waters of the Jordan, shivered with a flash of cold, and then turned silently away and returned to the life he had always known in Nazareth? Anyone can lose track of their life's purpose. The quiet years of Jesus' life have added up. He is not young by first century standards. The star of Bethlehem disappeared from the night sky long, long ago, decades ago. The song of the angels is just an old story, all but forgot. Surely even Jesus could be forgiven for staying the same, for choosing the life he has always known over the life that was meant for him. The waters of change are just so cold. They're just so clouded, you can't see where they'll take you. That is their mystery. That is their beauty. That is their fear. Even Jesus had to embrace the call to transformation. Transformation. When its day is upon you, will you step into the water? That old Calvinist, Anglican revivalist of the 1700s, if any of that makes sense together, That old Calvinist Anglican revivalist George Whitfield, a famous preacher, once said, It is a poor sermon that gives no offense, that neither makes the hearer displeased with himself nor with the preacher. Now, it is never my desire to offend. I am one of the most conflict-averse people you know. But we need to talk about some hard truths today. And if we cannot hear hard truths at church, then we will never hear them at all. The easy truths don't ask us to change. They comfort us. But they don't change anything. But if we refuse the call to change, then we become obsolete. As individuals, as a church, even as a culture, we can become obsolete and fade. If today is not a good day for you to ponder the painful realities afoot in our nation, if you are not in a good emotional space right now to talk about that today, then with all love and respect, I suggest that you stop this video and re-watch last week's service. Or maybe go back to the Christmas Eve service and listen to Handel's Messiah, Though there's even a line in that from the book of Malachi that says, who may abide the day of the Lord's coming? I'm not being snarky. Sarcasm has no place in the pulpit. But today is a day that we must talk. You and me were distracted on this day. We're having a hard time concentrating on those events so long ago, that mysterious day on the banks of a faraway river that most of us have never seen. Even if it was a day that changed the course of human history. It is our own day in history that occupies our minds, and rightly so. Never did we think that we would live to see the day when an angry mob incited by one who ought to represent our highest values, would break into our Capitol building to prevent Congress from enacting the will of the voters. Never did we think we would see an angry mob erecting a set of gallows outside the Capitol building and threatening to kill those who disagree with them. Never in all our lives did we imagine that a guy in a buffalo bikini would stand on the dais of that building, unopposed, and shake a spear with an American sword tied to it, and ululate. Our national psyche has been violated. And this event 
is not even a little bit comparable to the Black Lives Matter protests and riots that took place last year. For whether you support the Black Lives Matter movement or not, black people were rioting rioting because so many of their number were being killed without due process in the streets, sometimes in their homes, and at least one of them in her bed. These people, these people were rioting because their candidate did not win. Black Lives Matter riots were met with tear gas and violence. The riot most recently enacted entirely by white people in one of the sacred places of our national life, was met met with very little half-hearted opposition. It is time to change. As a society, as a church, as individuals, the time is upon us to change. This is a sacred time in our national life. We stand on the banks of that river which wends its way, its eternal course, down through all the ages of human history, that River Jordan. At times it runs wild and urgent. At times it runs deep and calm. But into every life that river flows, and always it beckons. Step into the water. It's time to be made new. Step into the water. Things cannot stay the way they are. Step into the water and change. Do we do it? Do we step into those cold waters, the bottoms of which we cannot see because they're muddy and opaque? Do we step into the water knowing that the time to change is upon us? Or do we trudge back up the hill and ignore the call? Do we try to go back to the life we knew? When have you heard and heeded the call to change? It is a new month, relatively, and a new week. It's a new year. Please, God, let it be a better one. Don't you think it's time for a change? The British writer Francis Spufford wrote a book some five or ten years ago And the name of the book is this, get this, it's a very long title, Unapologetic, Why Despite Everything, Christianity Can Still Make Surprising Emotional Sense. I I think unapologetic is kind of an ironic title, since the rest of the title sounds so apologetic. Why, despite everything, Christianity can still make a lot of uh, emotional sense. It's also a play on words because the book itself is a book of apologetics. Apologetics are sort of uh, argument in favor of Christian belief and doctrine. Although this one is liberally peppered with words that I dare not repeat. Interestingly, unlike other Christian apologists like Augustine and C.S. Lewis, Spufford does not use scripture or logic to make his case. Instead, he does the most 21st century thing you can imagine. He makes his appeal to emotion, (laughs) entirely to emotion. He believes that faith makes sense from an emotional point of view, that faith is one solution to deep emotional needs that exist in human beings. Spufford tells, I guess it's kind of his own story, his own faith journey, his testimony, if you will. Spufford tells the story of one night in 1997 when he and his wife stayed up from midnight until 6 a.m. arguing. He implies that he had been unfaithful to her, though he never comes out and says it. But the troubled couple spend the whole night going over and over the same old disappointments, the same old hurts, the same old grievances, until at last his wife has to go to work, and he, a writer, had to go to his coffee shop, presumably to write. But once he arrived at his favorite coffee shop, he was taken aback when the guy behind the counter put some music on, 
and it was Mozart's clarinet concerto, the Adagio. It's actually probably a familiar piece of music. You might recognize it. I, I would invite you after the sermon to look it up on YouTube, Mozart's clarinet concerto, Adagio. The song is lovely. It's slow and gentle. It's a whole eight minutes long. One writer has said that the song sounds like mercy. And Spufford writes, It is not music that denies anything. It offers a strong, absolutely calm rejoicing. But it does not pretend that there is no sorrow. On the contrary, it sounds as if it comes from a world where sorrow is perfectly ordinary. But still there is more to be said. I had heard it lots of times, he says. But this time it felt to me like news. It said, everything you fear is true. And yet, and yet. Everything that you have done wrong, you really have done wrong. And yet, and yet. The world is wider than you fear it is. Wider than the repeating rigmaroles in your mind. And it has this in it as truly as it contains your unhappiness. Shut up and listen, and let yourself count just a little bit on a calm that you did not have the ability to make for yourself. Because here it is, freely offered. You are still deceiving yourself, said the music, if you don't allow for the possibility of this. There is more going on here than what you deserve and don't deserve. There is this as well. And it played the tune again with all the cares in the world. That soul-restoring music under those raw circumstances created in one man's life an invitation to be transformed. An invitation to grasp something new, an invitation to step into the waters, the waters of change. That sweet, insightful music had cleared a space in his spirit, a numinous, watery moment of Jordan-like proportions when one troubled spirit was claimed by love and enabled to move forward into the new thing, the better thing that he was being called to become. Is it that simple? No, it's, it's a process and it's sticky and sometimes we take a few steps backward. But it's a call forward that we must heed. Transformation. Transformation. And there stands Jesus. On the banks of the River Jordan, even Jesus, facing his own private Rubicon, a river of decision, Fame has not yet claimed him. He's still free. He doesn't have to go to the cross. He's still free to drift quietly through his years. The handful that is left to him, if he should choose to do it, and, and to disappear from all memory. He could lead a relatively painless life of private joys and private sorrows and die a certainly painless death, or at least less painless than the one he got less painful than the one he got. Look at Jesus on the banks of the Jordan, deciding whether to wade out into the waters of our world and plunge himself into that river of change. It is an ages-old truth, whether for Jesus or for you or for me, if you don't change directions, you just might end up where you're headed, which in Jesus' case wasn't much of anywhere. But it was quiet, it was easy, it was relatively safe. And yet, into your life and into mine and into his, there comes a silent moment on the banks of the Jordan or in the notes of the Adagio. There comes a moment into our lives, a moment when we must choose. Do we go on as we are? Or do we step into the scary waters of change and change? Waters of change, waters of cleansing, 
waters of death, waters of life, transformation. Surely that is the thing that all the life of faith is really about. And the teachings of Christ, that must be what it all comes down to, this one thing. Transformation in this world, the new creation, rebirth, metamorphosis. There are as many words for it as there are variations on how it looks when it happens. The life of faith is about healing, growth, and change. Change of heart, change of mind, change in the individual, change in society, change in the world. Step into the water, Jesus. Just do it. Step into the water. Step into the water for its muddy currents will bear you away to Jerusalem and to Gethsemane and to the empty tomb. Step into the water, humble Galilean named Jesus. And in ages to come, cathedrals will be built to your glory and in your name. Step into the waters, and this old world will never be the same. What if he had not? For surely the thing that was true of Jesus, perhaps the most influential personality, personhood or personality in the history of the world, is also true for each person who finds herself or himself confronted with the opportunity to be transformed. If we say no, then we have refused a thing of grace and beauty not just to ourselves, but to the world that God wished to bless through us. Step into the water, Jesus. For all who have been claimed by love must share it. Don't you think he was at least a little bit scared? Scared of becoming the new thing that he felt himself at last being called to become. A wandering preacher, a teacher, a healer, a homeless prophet. Mark even tells us that Jesus' ecstatic experience in the waters of the Jordan shook him so badly that he had to flee into the wilderness for 40 days just to process it, to process the entire event. It was weird. The spirit descending like a dove, swooping with talons. The voice from heaven that nobody could hear but him, apparently. That secret voice promising him that he was the beloved, that he was beloved, that he was God's child, that he was acceptable. It was bizarre. And that declaration of love is surely the scariest thing of all. It's frightening to be loved. Because when somebody loves us, we owe them something, don't we? Love always calls us to step away from all that is broken and stuck inside of ourselves and to live into the fullness of our potential. It is frightening to be loved because love will cost us. Being loved gives us responsibilities. Being loved means that we belong not only to ourselves, but to the one who loves us. Being loved means that we too must love. Love beckons us out into the waters of change, out into the waters. Love beckons us to follow it, out into the deep unknown, and that is a scary thing to do. Some 10 years or so ago, Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a best-selling book called Eat, Pray, Love, and it was very popular. My wife and I read it to each other in the car on long drives. And she says this, I've never seen any life transformation that didn't begin with the person in question finally getting tired of their own BS. Though, of course, she did not feel the need to use the initials. You wake up one day on a morning that seems pretty much like the others, and you glance around to realize that your life is filled with things that you kind of chose. It doesn't really look like the thing you may have wanted for yourself. Your lofty ideals, your faded old dreams, 
Maybe you're even bored with what you got, but you got where you are largely by your own choosing, incrementally, step by step, day by day, hour by hour, you've arrived at this life through a long series of choices, each of which at the moment you made it might have temporarily outweighed the bigger things and the better things that you were aiming for. It's at times like these that you can almost hear the voice of those who loved you long ago whispering the painful question, why don't you move forward? Why don't you do the thing? Why don't you be the thing that you always knew you ought to do or ought to be? Why don't you let go of that bad habit? Why don't you dump that abusive relationship? Why don't you get rid of that negative, self-fulfilling attitude and live like the beloved? Live like one who is loved. Because when you are loved, you are free to turn around and share love. Is this not the very thing that scared Jesus so badly that he had to go into the wilderness for 40 days to think about it? And to struggle with the reality of his calling? Was this not the very thing that drove him to the cross? This realization that you are my beloved child? And with you, I am already pleased. You don't have to prove it or do anything. Jesus recognized right away at the baptism the demands that love would place upon his life. At his time in history, love would require him to stand up and to speak out and to get himself in trouble. Perhaps even to face a cross under the unjust sentence of blasphemy and sedition. No wonder he had to think it over for 40 days first. Love's demands are hard. And mute them we may, but they will not go away. Now, you and I also stand on the banks of a river. We stand at the edge of a new year, a new week, and if you're watching this video early, perhaps a new day. The spirit that hovered over the waters at creation is still moving over the waters of our world and the waters into which we must step, stirring them, creating their currents which will bear us we know not where. Those waters are cloudy and cold, but you are my beloved. You are my beloved. This is the promise that is whispered above the waters of change. You are my beloved, and love calls us to change. Love calls us to act. Love calls us to behave like those who deserve to be loved. It's not complicated. Indeed, it's very simple, but it is hard. We must live as those who are loved, free, free of envy, free of anger, free of fear, free of hate. Live as those who are loved, not those who have to protect. Our society is deeply and dangerously broken, and it is not unpatriotic to say so. The American spirit has proved itself at times nobly and bravely to be resourceful and creative and merciful and kind. But our national psyche also was cradled in cruelty, And we have yet to resolve our collective doubts about human worth. We have yet to understand that human beings have innate worth simply because God's eternal spirit moves within them and not because of their race or social standing or anything they command or produce or do. Love. Love makes us no longer our own. Love makes us, to some degree, public property. Being loved requires us to live with love toward others. And yet, years of injustice, and we cannot deny their existence, have sort of beaten us down. They've beaten down our spirits, and we've learned to take things for granted. And in recent years especially, we have been regaled and demoralized by hateful speech and vitriol. 
It has further further alienated us from the noble and the brave and the resourceful selves that we have sometimes been. It has all but drowned out the forward call to be the baptized selves that we can and ought to be. But sometimes, sometimes we'll hear a bit of music amid the tumult of our lives, and it will say something to the soul that no words could ever speak. Or maybe a word will do it. Something will bring us to the edge of the river, and we will recognize the need to change. We will see something new pushing up through the frozen earth of our life like the the first yellow little flowers of the colt's foot announcing the arrival of spring. That music or whatever it is that prompts us toward change, that music makes us want to do better, to be better. Sometimes we just get tired of the way we're living or bored or restless or scared. And we see that old river flow and we know that it is time to change as much as we do not want to immerse ourselves in its chilly, scary waters. Waters of change, waters of wonder, waters of fear. Do this with me. Close your eyes. Imagine yourself stepping into those waters, saying no to your fears, saying no to the comfortable old self that you could be, saying no to the carpenter's shop up the hill that you could return to. Imagine the muddy earth squishing between your toes. Imagine the chill as it gradually reaches up to your knees, your waist, your shoulders. Imagine as it passes over your head. And then those words, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. It is time to change. It is time to love as you have been loved. It is time to turn our backs on the old lives of ease and comfort that we knew. It is time to use our privilege to insist upon the human dignity of all. Transformation. It begins with the realization that we are loved. But it doesn't end there. It calls us to see the other as God's beloved as well. It calls us to the cross and to new life on the other side. Whenever we are met with these 21st century feelings of stuckness, of rage, of hate, of fear, when these negative emotions engulf us, I invite you to respond with these words. Speak them to yourself. Speak them quietly under your breath. If you say them out loud, it'll be weird. Speak them quietly to strangers. You are my beloved. You are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Amen. Let us pray. O Christ, by your epiphany, your light shines upon us and upon all the earth, giving us the fullness of salvation. Help us to show your light to all the, all the people we meet this day. O Christ of glory, you humbled yourself to be baptized. 
showing us the way of humility. Strengthen us to serve you in humility all the days of our life. O Christ, by your baptism, you cleansed us of our sin, making us children of your Father. Give the grace of being a child of God to all who seek you. O Christ, by your baptism, you sanctified creation and opened the door for change, for repentance, for transformation to all who will set foot into the chilly waters. Make us servants of your gospel in the world. O Christ, by your baptism you revealed to us the glorious trinity when the voice from heaven proclaimed, This is my beloved child, and the Holy Spirit descended upon you like a dove. Renew a heart of worship in all who are baptized. And we ask you to hear us, for the needs of our world are many, and we would pray for them. We pray for this nation so long divided that we would recognize our common humanity and turn to each other in love. We pray for the incoming administration and we pray for all the leaders of this world that they would have wisdom, that they would seek your way, that they would be ruled by peace, that the peace of Christ would rule in their hearts We pray for the peoples of the earth that they would have peace and that there would always be enough for everyone. We pray for those of our number who are upon our hearts, Barb Oram, Linda James, Jeff Carper, Jean Dunphy, Denny Geis, Nancy Geis, Dave Green, Nancy Green, Andrew Astorita, Leroy Blondeau, Jeff Conte, Tommy DeSantis, Shelley Farr, Bethany Fox, Neil Harrison, Reverend Kevin Haley, Wiley Irwin, the family of Jason Martin, Melody Cronwald, Betseda Lima Moraes, Rick Miller, First Baptist Church and its minister, the Reverend Glenn Loper, Brian McFeely, Luann Pattison, Virginia Ryan Statler, Brian Shanahan. And in the silence of this moment, we would raise before you those whom we have not named, but who are upon our minds and hearts. And we ask you to hear us as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We do thank you for being here with us today, and we would encourage you to check your emails from the church frequently. There is much going on, and it's not announced as much in the church services, but we do send them the, uh, the announcements to you by email. And now receive the benediction. Go into the world knowing compassion and seeking justice. Give voice to the silent. Give strength to the weak. See one another. Hear one another. Love one another. It is as simple as that and indeed very hard. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.